So this lecture will talk about frequency compensation of amplifiers. In the last lecture, we had discussed uh, stability. So let us quickly revise what we had studied there. Uh, what we had discovered was that the transfer function must have at least three poles for it to potentially be unstable under negative feedback. Uh, when will such a, an amplifier be unstable? If at the unity gain frequency, the transfer function has a phase margin less than or equal to zero or a phase less than or equal to minus 180 degrees, then the amplifier will be unstable and it will oscillate under negative feedback. If it has a phase margin greater than zero, then the amplifier is stable but for uh, making sure that the ringing is minimal, a phase margin greater than or equal to 45 degrees is desirable. Uh, how do we achieve a 45 degree phase margin? Uh, so if you look at the Bode plot, the way to achieve a 45 degree phase margin is that the, in the magnitude plot, there can be only one pole above the unity gain or 0 dB frequency and the second pole must be at the unity gain frequency. Such a Bode plot has a phase margin of 45 degrees. We also saw last time that high gain amplifiers almost always have three or more poles and therefore they are almost always unstable. Okay, so now let us see what to do. So we say that uh, something has to be changed or added to an unstable amplifier to make it stable. Now whatever that thing is that we add or that process or that method is called frequency compensation. Uh, now there are many many uh, probably three dozen techniques that you will find in the literature on how to uh, compensate an amplifier. Uh, there are different circuit techniques. Uh, you will learn some of them formally in the control systems course. Here we will just learn one technique which is very popular in amplifier design and a large number of commercial op amps use it. It is called dominant pole compensation. Okay, So let us look at this. So let us look at this Bode plot. Uh, which of a, some uh, fictitious high gain uh, amplifier that happens to have three poles. So the a magnitude plot is flat for low frequencies and then there is a P1 and a P2 and a P3 and the gain falls at minus 20, minus 40 and minus 60 dB per decade and all three poles are above the unity gain frequency. Here is the unity gain frequency. So if you look at the phase plot, at P1 the phase is minus 45 degrees, at P2 minus 135, at P3 minus 225 and at unity gain frequency somewhere in between minus 225 and minus 270. So the actual phase is whatever and if we add 180 to it, we are saying the phase margin is of the order of minus 60 degrees. Phase margin is minus 60 degrees it must be at least plus 45 degrees. Okay, so what does dominant pole compensation do? Uh, let us see. So this is the same uh, Bode plot. What dominant pole compensation uh, technique says is, we want the uh, in the we need to modify this Bode plot. And if we want a 45 degree phase margin, then the second pole must be at the unity gain frequency. Now what does that mean for the Bode plot? That means that uh, for frequencies less than P2 and up to some P1, the gain will have a slope of 20 dB per decade. So if you have to draw a line at 20 dB per decade starting with P2 at unity gain frequency. So let us say we draw a line like that. Then it comes here. Actually, I have drawn it. So, let us draw it. Okay. So, here is a line. So, we draw a line. We say we make P2 the unity gain frequency. What does that do to P1? So, this has to be 20 dB per decade. 
so we say p1 has to be here the modified p1 okay so this is what we are saying we make or we move the dominant pole from p1 to some much lower frequency so that at p2 the gain becomes 1 all right so that's what we do the dominant pole is moved to the left this is dominant pole compensation when when this is done we we'll, okay so let's draw the rest of the body plot so okay so from p2 the gain will fall at minus 40 and then at minus 60 all right and then if we draw the phase uh, then the phase will be minus 45 uh, at this modified p1 then it will become 90 and the phase will stay constant until the second pole is encountered which is starting here one decade before p2 and then the body the phase plot will simply follow the original because p2 p3 are the same we are assuming that p2 p3 are not changed we are moving only p1 to the left all right so we say let us call this modified dominant pole as p1 c c for compensated and if we do this oops sorry if we do this then we will get a phase margin of plus 45 degrees so this technique is called as dominant pole compensation moving the dominant pole p1 to the left all right and now let's do quick numericals for the op amp 741 we know that the 741 low frequency gain is about 100,000. Uh, we also, we say let the second pole be at 1 megahertz. In fact, we, uh, we have discussed this very briefly that the 741 has a unity gain frequency of 1 megahertz. So we will say let, let the unity gain frequency be 1 megahertz and then where should the dominant pole be? All right, so we know that the gain bandwidth product is 1 megahertz. So gain times the new bandwidth, which is P1C, must be equal to P2. So we say 100,000 times P1C must be uh, 10 raised to 6. So P1C is 10 hertz. So in this plot, P1C is 10 hertz. All right, the 3 dB frequency of the 741 is 10 hertz. I have these nagging suspicions that we have discussed this sometime, but that's okay. This is a revision. Uh, so what this means is that when we do dominant pole compensation, the minus 3 dB frequency will become very small. 10 hertz is a very small number, which is not good. Of course, nobody wants really, I mean, ideally, I don't want an amplifier which has a 3 dB frequency of 10 hertz. But I don't have a choice. If I don't compensate, the amplifier doesn't even work. It is useless. So in order to make it useful, I have to do this compensation and I have to live with it. This is a price. This is a sacrifice I must make to have an op amp that at least works. That at least when I put it under negative feedback, it will behave as an amplifier and not start oscillating. All right. But okay. So what is the point? Why, I mean, how will we use an amplifier whose gain starts dropping at 10 hertz? Most signals in the world have frequencies greater than 10 hertz. In fact, the only realistic signals that have frequencies less than 10 hertz are human body signals, like the heart rate is about 1.2 hertz or something. That is all. Most signals have more than 10 hertz. And yet, 741 remains a widely used op amp. So, how does this happen? Again, I think we've discussed this. So, let us quickly give the answer to this question. The answer lies in negative feedback. We go back to the first lecture of this series. We had studied that the gain bandwidth product remains constant under negative feedback. So, for for the open loop 741, the gain bandwidth product is 1 megahertz. What that means is if I, and again is 100,000. If I put negative feedback and if I have a closed loop gain of 20, then the bandwidth will be 50 kilohertz that because the gain bandwidth product 
50 kilo times 20 is 1000 kilo which is 1 megahertz so under closed loop gain my bandwidth increased and 50 kilohertz is a respectable bandwidth and in fact so for audio applications i need a bandwidth of 20 kilohertz so i can use the 741 in a 7 closed loop configuration for let's say for audio applications up to a gain of let's say if this is 20 so this will be 50 up to a gain of 50 all right so this is the answer to this question not this question yeah this question what is the use the use is that under closed loop the frequency that it can be used up to is much larger and so these are usable op amps so let us now discuss how to compensate this two stage op amp which you are going to build in your fourth assignment the design, let us begin at the beginning, the design of such an op amp begins with the steps that we have discussed in previous lectures and which you have done in assignments 2 and 3. So you will design for the gain, the voltage swing and perhaps also the DC power specifications uh, and then design the widths and the gate voltages to meet these different specs. Power is a little dicey because the power affects the speed and all that, we will talk about it. Once this is done, then we look at the frequency response of the op amp and then we look at the phase margin. And this, because this op amp is a very high gain amplifier, the phase margin is almost definitely guaranteed to be negative. And because it is negative, we will have to do some frequency compensation to make it stable and make the phase margin positive. For our circuit, we will apply dominant pole compensation to make the phase margin about 45 degrees or 60 degrees. And to apply dominant pole compensation, we will do two steps. First, we have to identify the node at which the dominant pole is occurring. And then at that node, we have to change something so that the frequency of that pole becomes smaller and uh, the condition of that frequency times again become equal to the second pole is satisfied. So let us look at this circuit and first ask ourselves where at what node is the dominant pole appearing. The answer is actually it's obvious but let us talk about it because it may not be obvious. At this node, the output of the first stage, the output resistance is very high if it, it, it is of the order of GMRO squared. And the capacitance is high also because of the Miller capacitance of M11 because that CGD11 gets multiplied by the gain of the second stage. So usually the dominant pole in such a two stage amplifier always occurs at the output of the first stage at the node VO1. But there are some systems where the load connected to this op amp has a very high capacitance. It can be thousands of picofarads. And if that is the case, then the dominant pole can occur at the output node when the CL becomes very large. Uh, so these are two different cases. We will assume that the dominant pole occurs at VO1 and that CL is not so large that the dominant pole occurs at VO. So we will design our compensation scheme with the dominant pole occurring at VO1. Alright, now that we have identified the node, we say okay we want to make that pole we call P1 at the node VO1 reduced to some P1C such that this condition is satisfied. A0 times the compensated P1 equal to the second pole as we have seen before. So P1C is the frequency with compensation. So let us write P1 first and then we will talk about how to reduce the value of P1. So P1 of course is 1 over R out 1 into C1 where R out 1 is the output resistance 
at the node VO1 and C1 is the total capacitance at that node. Now we want to reduce P1 to a smaller value. So of course there are two ways of doing this. Either we increase R out 1 or we increase C1. Of course you can do both but we'll talk about them separately. Let us start with R out 1 and then we'll go to C1. So let us talk about how R out 1 can be increased and what are the effects of that increase on the frequency as well as in fact the voltage gain. So R out 1 in a simplest form can be written as Gm RO squared by 2. So what is R out 1? R out 1 is actually the resistance at this node. So it is Gm 6 RO 6 RO 8 in parallel with Gm 4 RO 4 ro2 right so if we assume just for the sake of a qualitative discussion that all the gms and ro's are the same then this is gm ro square looking up and there is gm ro square looking down and therefore we get gm ro squared by 2 and then we write so this is half into gm which is 2 id over v o v into ro the whole squared so that's 1 over lambda id the whole square and 1 ID cancels, the 2's cancel and we get 1 over VOV lambda ID. Now we want to increase R out 1. So we can reduce VOV lambda or ID or more than 1. Let us talk about them separately. So let us begin by discussing what happens if we reduce ID to increase R, increase R out 1. And then we will do the other two. Okay, so let us say we want to reduce ID so as to increase R out 1 so as to move the dominant pole to a lower frequency. So we want to reduce only ID and not affect VOV or lambda. All right, so that's because if we try to uh, change multiple variables, then the discussion and the analysis becomes very complicated. So it is better to stick to one variable at a time. So how can we reduce ID but not change VOV? Well, what we do is we change or reduce all the widths proportionately and we had seen this in a discussion of the, uh, the design of the telescopic cascode amplifier that once the op amplifier is designed and we have decided the widths and the gate voltages of all transistors whatever widths are there if we multiply all of them by the same factor then the gain remains unaffected but the current can change either increase or decrease so if you want to reduce id we can reduce all the widths by some factor and the drain current will reduce the gain will remain the same therefore or so one another way of saying the same thing is to say that when we reduce ID to increase R out, reducing ID causes GM to decrease by the same factor because GM is proportional to I, uh, is equal to ID over VOV and we are keeping VOV constant. So GM if ID is reduced, GM reduces, R out increases. But Gm R out the product remains the same, therefore the voltage gain remains the same. Alright, so this is in fact one way to re reduce the dominant pole frequency is to reduce ID by reducing all the widths by the same factor. Alright, in a real design what happens is that ID is determined actually by the slew rate specification and we have actually not discussed slew rate till now we will discuss it later uh, when we go back to chapter 9 by the end of chapter 9. So for now I am just saying that ID will be decided ID of the first stage which is what we are talking about here is decided by the slew rate and whatever the slew rate spec allows we will make it that value and not any higher because the lower the ID is the higher the R out and lower is the dominant pole uh, which we are trying to minimize. Alright, let us think about 
no before that okay so i wanted to make a general comment i could have made this a few lectures ago but it didn't happen so i'm making it now so we note here and i'm repeating this because it is so important that id provides an independent parameter to change the frequency response of an amplifier without changing the voltage gain all right because it changes r out but it doesn't change the voltage gain and therefore id can be used to make the circuit faster or slower without affecting the voltage gain and the higher the drain current is the lower the r out is and the higher the pole is because pole the dominant pole goes as 1 over r out so higher the current lower r out higher the bandwidth and higher the speed of the circuit all right so higher the current higher the speed of the circuit and this is a fundamental pro uh, property of all electronic circuits that if i want to increase the speed of a circuit i provide larger currents all right so higher the speed higher the current therefore of course higher the power consumption and this is the classic speed power trade off if i want low power i'll have to live with low speeds also and vice versa the physics of this of course i should say the electrical circuit aspect of this is actually straightforward speed is ultimately limited by capacitances in the circuit if i want to charge the capacitors faster so as to increase speed i have to provide a larger current to so that the capacitors charge faster and then the, of course the power consumption is larger all right <coughs> note also very important that if i can change the speed by changing the dc drain current without affecting the voltage gain what this is telling me is that the bandwidth of my amplifier can be changed by changing the current while the gain is maintained constant which means that the gain bandwidth product of an operational amplifier can be changed by changing the dc current of an op amp the gain bandwidth product is not constant it is determined by the current we choose to flow through that operational amplifier all right the gain bandwidth product becomes a constant only to the user of the op amp not to the designer of the op amp all right let us go back to r out 1 so the other way to increase r out 1 is to reduce vov and or lambda all right now vov and lambda both affect the voltage gain right because the voltage gain is goes as 1 over vov times lambda the whole squared for a, a telescopic cascode amplifier uh okay so i have made a comment here that i am saying vov vov but which vov we are talking about you please go back and think about or right? it's important i couple of slides ago i said that i am assuming all the vovs are equal but this is which transistor vov uh, you please keep that in mind all right uh, so what we are saying is that if we reduce vov or lambda r out one will increase all right which is good for the dominant pole moving to a smaller value but at the same time the voltage gain also increases by the same factor as the dominant pole decreases because the the dependence of v gain and r r out on vov and lambda is the same but for dominant pole compensation the way we if you remember the way we designed that i mean came up with dominant pole compensation was that we'll keep the gain constant and move the dominant pole to the left then only we achieve compensation and a positive phase margin this is not doing that and let us see on a bode plot why this is not doing that so here is a bode plot without compensation as we had, this is a plot we had seen before we want to move p1 down to a lower frequency so that the gain will start falling and it will meet 
the Bode plot will meet the zero degree axis at P2. Changing V O V or lambda increases the gain and this is the Bode plot one gets. So the P1 has moved to the left from here to here because of R out becoming larger so that the P1 is smaller. But the gain has increased by the same factor as R out has decreased so that the new gain is higher, P is lower but P2, P3 being unaffected, the phase margin of this new Bode plot is still negative. It did not do anything to the phase margin. The phase margin is affected only if the this 20 dB per decade line is down so that it meets uh, 0 dB at P2. Therefore, changing V O V or lambda does not affect the phase margin of a circuit. All right. So one does, one does not play around with V O V or lambda. All right. So what is done in in a real uh, design is that one reduces I D to the extent possible while keeping the slew rate criterion in mind but that is never enough to make the phase margin positive and therefore then the only thing that is left to do to make the phase margin positive is to increase the capacitance at the dominant pole the node of the dominant pole by increasing the capacitance p1 will reduce uh, and then one will get a positive phase margin. So let us do the equations with a capacitance being increased at that node. All right. So we write for A0, P1 and P2. And as we have seen now many times, what we want is A0, P1 compensated equal to P2. So this is without compensation. Uh, so what we will do is now we will add a capacitance at this node, at the node of O1 so that the capacitance becomes C1 plus some Cx which we have added and then we want A0 into P1C equal to P2. So we say A0 into P1C equal to P2 and P1C is R out 1 into C1 plus Cx. Cx is the capacitance we add at VO1. So that is a Cx added. So I have drawn only part of the circuit here that is relevant to compensation the rest of the telescopic cascade are not shown to save some space on the slide so this is an equation and now we need to find cx such that this equation is satisfied and then we'll get a phase margin of 45 degrees so let's solve for cx so this uh, r out ones cancel and then r out to c2 goes on that side c1 plus cx on this side and so we get cx equal to gm1 gm11 r out to squared c2 minus c1 and this is typically the first term is much much larger than the second so cx is approximately this basically gm squared ro squared c2 now let's put some representative numbers to get a feel so i have put gm1 equal to gm11 uh, equal to 3 milliamp per volt r out 2 equal to 10 kilo ohm C1 is 2 picofarads, C2 is 0.4 picofarads. R out 1, I have put here, we are not using it here, but we will use it later when we do further discussion. So R out 1 of course is much larger than R out 2 because this is the output resistance of a cascode. R out is a resistance simply of a common source amplifier. C1 is larger than C2 because C1, the capacitance at this node, has a gate source capacitance as well as the Miller capacitance of M11. Alright, so we put in all these numbers. So Cx is equal to basically Gm squared R out squared. So Gm R out is 900. So this is 900 squared into C2.4, which is this of course much larger than 2. And that turns out to be 324 nanofarads. Right, so these 0.4 is pico and it's getting multiplied by a very large amount. So this is 324 nanofarads. This is a huge capacitance for an IC. 9 nano is huge. 300 nano is a very large capacitance 
it is very difficult to fit the, this on a chip but we want a capacitance on a chip to compensate so what to do we have to think about a way of reducing this capacitance so that it can fit on a chip all right so this you think about how can we reduce this capacitance while my still achieving a phase margin of 45 degrees we'll pick this up in the next lecture where we'll talk about miller compensation okay